do you believe in God? Because if you don't, the Bible actually calls you a fool. Doesn't sound very nice, does it? But think this through. A fool is not necessarily stupid. He just doesn't recognize the obvious. Today, we're going to talk about what's obvious, as we can see from behind us, and why it's foolish not to believe in God. All right, welcome to our Psalm series. Super glad you are joining us today. Um, I want to start here because today we're going to talk about what the Bible says about fools and what actually Psalms, the Psalms about it. So we're going to start here. Here's what I want you to see. A fool is not necessarily stupid. He just doesn't recognize the obvious. Now, this is why I have to tell you my funny little joke. Uh, if you've been with us, I've, you've probably heard this before, but this is kind of like stating the obvious. Sherlock Holmes and, and Dr. Watson went on a camping trip. After a good meal, they lay down at nighttime, went to sleep in their tent. But some hours later, Holmes woke up and nudged his faithful friend and said, Watson, look up at the sky and tell me what you see. Watson said, well, I see millions and millions of stars. Holmes asked, well, what does that tell you? Watson thought a minute and he said, well, astronomically, it tells me that there's millions of galaxies and potentially billions of planets. Astrologically, I observe that Saturn is in Leo. Horologically, I deduce that the time is approximately a quarter past three. Theologically, I can see that God is omnipotent and he's, he's amazing and he created all of this. In other words, we're kind of small and insignificant. Meteorologically, he said, I suspect that we're going to have a beautiful day tomorrow. Watson asked Holmes, well, what does it tell you? And Holmes says, well, it actually says that someone stole our tent. <laughs> I thought that was cute, but some of the smartest people we know can be fools. And the Bible talks a lot about them. In fact, the word fool is used in Proverbs 65 times, in Proverbs, just Proverbs alone. Because Proverbs is trying to, to make a point and show you the difference between someone who is foolish and someone who is wise. In the psalm that we're talking about today, David writes about a foolish person. And this is what he says, Psalm 14, verse 1. He says, for the director of music of David, remember all these psalms, most of them are set to music and then sung in the temple. But verse 1 says this, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Right off the bat, David says that anyone who doesn't believe in God is a fool. But then that poses a question, like what if a person was never raised going to church? What if a person lives in a remote village in Africa and, and no one ever taught them about God? We live in America. We go to church. We can hear about God. We have a Bible. Some people don't. But the Apostle Paul says this in Romans 1. He said people have no excuse because God made it very clear by what we have behind us, the scene, the, the, the galaxies, the, the, the earth, the moon, all of these things. Look at Romans 1.18. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Why? Since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world and God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. Foolish people, when they say they don't believe in God, they're fools because they're without excuse. Like all we have to do is look at, look at the earth and then look up in the sky. It's so evident that there has to be a God. Because what we see is creation could not have happened without a creator. It really couldn't. One night in Egypt, Napoleon pointed to the stars and said this, For no other reason than those lights up there, I'm convinced there is a God. 
We should all be that wise. But if we can't see that, the Bible clearly states that we are a fool. We see this on TV, we see it in the media, on social media, in the colleges, the academic realm now, where people just go, well, I don't believe in God. And honestly, that's ridiculous. Because their thought process is, I'm too smart for that. I have this great education. I'm a scientist. I'm a doctor. I'm way too wise to believe that there is a God. Even though they see what everyone else sees. And the Bible says, verse 21, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him. But their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools. A Jewish rabbi was sitting uh, next to an atheist who believed in evolution. He was sitting next to him on an airplane. Every few minutes, the rabbi's children or grandchildren would inquire about his needs, like, Grandpa, do you need food? Do you need drink? What can I get you? Do you need a blanket? The atheist commented, and he said, the respect your children and grandchildren give you is, is amazing. He said, mine don't show me respect at all. The rabbi responded, and he said, well, because you're an atheist, I want you to think that through. To my children, I'm Jewish, I believe in God. He said, to my children and grandchildren, I am one step closer in a chain of tradition to the time when God spoke to the whole Jewish people on Mount Sinai. He said, to your grandchildren, being an atheist, you are one step closer to being an ape. <laughs> I was like, okay, that's kind of funny. But Paul goes further with this idea of fools. Because if we take our belief in Jesus serious, then it changes everything. It changes how we act, how we think, what we do in life. Because when you and I give our life to Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes into our life. He changes us on the inside, so we should look different. We should look more and more like Jesus himself. But for those who don't believe in God, they can live however they want to. There's, there's no regard for God whatsoever, so therefore they can live and do and act and say whatever they want. But the problem with Bible says is this, that God does this. He turns them over to themselves. To me, that's a really scary thought. For those living in willful sin and not taking God serious and not believing Him, not taking to heart what God actually calls sin, God turns them over to their own sin. Watch this in Romans 1, verse 24. Therefore God gave them over in their sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the Creator who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them, gave them over to their shameful lust. Even their women exchanged natural relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed indecent acts with other men and received it on themselves the due penalty for their perversion. The Bible is so clear that, that homosexuality is not of God, but that when somebody goes down that path, God says, all right, I've showed you who I am. Go look outside, look up, see everything out there, but you're not going to believe in me. You're not going to take what I say is truth in the Bible, so I'm going to turn you over to your own lusts. What's shocking is that there's some churches that put the Bible, move it aside, don't teach this passage, and say, hey, you're fine. You can live a gay lifestyle, and you can, you know, be a Christian. The, the Bible doesn't say that. God is not okay with that. He just made that very clear in Romans 1. But God says, here's the problem. When, when I turn you over, it's because you're fools. You're being foolish. You're not taking God serious and you're not taking his word serious. Verse 28 says this, therefore, or furthermore, since they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, he gave them over to a depraved mind to do what ought not be done. See, Paul doesn't stop with homosexuality. 
it's not like you know I'm picking on just that one particular people group. There's a list of people that do evil things. And God says, these are foolish people, adulterers, liars, thieves. You know, he has this whole list. God says, here's the problem. You live that kind of lifestyle, you're a fool, and God will turn you over to that particular lifestyle. And then there's judgment to come on the other end of that. He goes on to verse 29 to tell you, look at this. They become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed, depravity. They're full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice. They're gossips, slanders, God-haters, insolent, arrogant, and boastful. They invent ways of doing evil. They disobey their parents. They're senseless, faithless, heartless, ruthless. And God said this in verse 32, although they know God's righteous decree. How do they know it? What we have behind us. Look up. Look up. That should point you to God, which would point you to his word. And then you open the Bible and you get to know this God. He goes on to so, say that although they know, they, they know God's righteous decree, that those who do such things deserve death. They not only continue to do them, the very things, but they also approve of those who practice them. We have a friend that um, their daughter was, of course, raised in the church. And, um, and she ended up walking away and then moving into this whole lesbian lifestyle. And, but it's shocking because she went that direction because all the people that she started hanging around with approved of a homosexual lifestyle. And so that's exactly what the Bible says is going to happen. It's like people approve it. And you think it's okay, but it's really not. You have to, the Bible has to be your final authority. Which takes us to Psalm 14, verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. Their deeds are vile. See, when someone doesn't believe in God, then it just opens them up to live however they want. They can hurt people, abuse people, treat people however they want. Because there's no standard for living. They don't believe in God's laws or his ways. So they act corruptly. We see this so plainly in the story that David, King David, was a part of. At this particular point, David was not king yet. He was still on the run from, from King Saul. And he and his men were helping out a sheep owner in Carmel. It was sheep shearing time and David and his men were kind of like the bodyguards. They were, they were keeping all the thieves and the bandits away from this particular owner. And when people did that, the owners were supposed to give them, like give David, uh, something for their effort. Maybe some money, maybe some, you know, sheep, whatever. But one man that David was protecting was the perfect example of a fool. In fact, his name was Nabal, which actually meant fool. Look at 1 Samuel 25. A certain man in Maon who had property there at Carmel was very wealthy. He had a thousand goats and three thousand sheep, which he was shearing in Carmel. His name was Nabal and his wife's name was Abigail. She was an intelligent and beautiful woman, but her husband, a Calebite, was surly and mean in his dealings. While David was in the desert, he heard that Nabal was shearing sheep, so he sent ten young men and said to them, Go up to Nabal at Carmel and greet him in my name. Say to him, Long life to you, good health to you and your household, and good health to all that is yours. Now I hear that it's sheep shearing time. When your shepherds were with us, we did not mistreat them, and the whole time they were at Carmel, nothing of theirs was missing. Ask your own service and they will tell you. Therefore, be favorable towards my young men, since we come at festive time, Please give your servants and your son David whatever you can find for them. When David's men arrived, they gave Nabal this message in David's name, and then they waited. Nabal answered David's servants, Who is this David? Who is the son of Jesse? Many servants are breaking away from their masters these days. Why should I take my bread and water and the meat I have slaughtered from my shears and give it to men coming from who knows where? Nabal was a fool for doing that. But why wouldn't he? Because fools only care for themselves. Fools only care for their own gain. Verse 12 said, David's men turned around and went back. And when they arrived, they reported every word. And David was furious. Verse 13 says this, David said to his men, put on your swords. 
So they put on their swords and David put on his. About 400 men went up with David while 200 stayed with the supplies. David is going to kill every man in Nabal's household. But thankfully, Nabal had a smart, beautiful wife, Abigail. She hears that this happened and she's so shocked. But so what she does is she gathers together a whole bunch of food and she tries to get to David before David gets to her. She's riding, and here's what's happened in verse 20. As she came riding her donkey into a mountain ravine, there were David and his men descending towards her, and she met them. David said, had just said, It's been useless, all my watching over this fellow's property in the desert so that nothing of his was missing. He has paid me back evil for good. May God deal with David, be it ever so severely, if by morning I leave alive one male of all who belong to him. That's, that's his conversation before he comes across Abigail. Verse 23, when Abigail saw David, she quickly got off her donkey, bowed down before David with her face to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, my Lord, let the blame be on me alone. Please let your servant speak to you. Hear what your servant says. May my Lord pay no attention to that wicked man, Nabal. He is just like his name. His name is Fool and Folly goes with him. David, is so amazed at this woman that he literally listens to her and he turns around and leaves. And what we see with Abigail is a very, very wise woman. What we see with her husband is someone who's very, very foolish. It goes on to say in verse 36 that when Abigail went to Nabal, he was in the house holding a banquet like that of a king. He was in high spirits and very drunk, so she told him nothing of what happened until, that, until daybreak. Then in the morning when Nabal was sober, his wife told him all these things about David, and his heart failed him and he became like a stone. About 10 days later, the Lord struck Nabal and he died. The coolest part of this story is that David goes back and gets Abigail and marries her. So there you go for love stories. But the point is this, Nabal is a fool. His life is about him. He's a drunk. He uses people. He lives for what he can get for himself. But this story reminds us that God always has the last word. And God struck Nabal dead for being a fool. We see another section in the Bible that talks about a fool. Jesus tells a story about a man who, who doesn't care about God at all. He only cares about his own stuff. Luke 12, verse 16, Jesus says this, And he told them this parable, the, the ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. So the man thinks to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be for anyone who stores up things for himself, but who is not rich towards God. Jesus is reminding us over and over again that fools only care about themselves and not for the things of God. Which is a good place to stop and ask ourselves, who am I actually living for? Am I living for a life of wisdom, caring more about the things of God, living for God's agenda, or am I living like a fool? And I'm caring more about me. Everything's about me, I, whatever I want. Psalm 14, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. Their deeds are vile. There is no one who does good. But God wants to know this. God wants us to know this in verse 2, Psalm 14, verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven on the sons of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. But all have turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is no one who does good not even one. Now, that verse might remind you if you know the New Testament, because Paul talks about this in Romans 3.23. This is how we know that you and I are born into sin. Romans 3.20, sin, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We're separated from God because of our sin. But Romans 6.23 says this, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's a really important reminder for us.
that we were born into sin, but we can come to Jesus and he pays the penalty for us. And then we become right with God. Psalm 14, 4, uh, verse 4 says this, Will evildoers never learn? My version of that is, what is wrong with people? All you have to do is look at the beautiful scenery behind me and say, how in the world can someone not believe in God? It continues on in verse 4 that says, those who devour my people as many bread and who do not call on the Lord. He's like, well, I don't get it. And some of you really understand this because you follow Jesus and those around you don't. They mock you, they persecute you, they make fun of you. And you feel like you're being devoured by people who do not call on the Lord. David is feeling the same way. He's looking around and, and thinking of his life on the run and he's trying not to be devoured by Saul and those who do not call on the Lord. But here's what is amazing. For as much as they try to devour people, for as much as, as your friends try to hurt you because of your faith in Jesus, they're actually really afraid of you. Look at John 3.20. Everyone who does evil, the foolish people, hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Rob was talking the other day about some friends we used to have. And as we started growing in our faith, they stopped hanging around us. And it dawned on me, this is why. When someone who wants to live a godly life is around someone who doesn't want to live a godly life, then it sheds light, more light on their sin, and they don't like that feeling. The darkness hates the light. Psalm 14, 5 says this, They are overwhelmed with dread, for God is present in the company of the righteous. Isn't that amazing? Verse 6, you evildoers frustrate the plans of the poor, but the Lord is their refuge. This is what David is constantly saying in all of his psalms. The Lord is our refuge. Because whether it's in this life or the next life after we die, God's going to deal with evil, foolish people. But David ends this psalm with hope. Look at verse 7. Oh, that salvation for Israel would come out of Zion. He's saying, ah, we're looking forward to a day when, when salvation will come out of Zion. Zion's like Jerusalem. Because we know from Genesis 3, we see someone that's alluded to that will come on the scene and, and, and crush the evil one. We see Abraham through his seed would be the promised Messiah. We see this promised Messiah that would come through the lineage of David, and we know that to be Jesus. That is our hope. Oh, salvation for Israel. Zechariah 9, 9 says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. That is a prophecy that we see fulfilled when Jesus rides on a donkey to Jerusalem. David ends this psalm with this, When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. Can I just say this? That Jesus is coming back. He came once and he will come back to set things right in this world. The world is a mess. The world has so much evil and wickedness and foolish people in it. And yet Jesus is coming back to make things right the way they were back in the days of, of, of Adam and Eve before they sinned. The older I get, honestly, the more I look forward to that day. And David somehow caught a glimpse of this and welcomed this day. It gave him hope for, this, for life. We see this in Revelation 19. This is about Jesus. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. Jesus is coming back to judge and make war against the, the foolish Nabals of the world. Verse 12 says, his eyes are like a blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on it that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe, dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. 
The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. There will come a day when all fools everywhere who refuse to believe in God, even though it's so evident to them, people who choose pride and sin over God, that will be their end for all eternity. And it's going to be judgment. The Bible makes that clear. So the lesson for today is this. Do not be a fool. Turn to Jesus, give your life to him, and start reading the Bible and learning about him. Because foolishness never turns out well in the long run. Have a good day.